Welcome to this evening's study session at General McLean School District for February 9th, beginning here at 6.30, one. Um, we are, have a couple people coming in, but we have what we need for uh, the full discussion, or, you know, to begin. So we're going to go ahead and do that. We have presentations, discussion information this evening. We're going to start with remote instruction update, Dr. Lane, Dr. Carnes. Thank you, Mrs. Crow. Uh, regarding remote our remote instruction day. As you know, we had our first remote instruction day uh, last week. And before we hear from Dr. Carnes, I think just some important things to remember about remote instruction days um, is that a remote instruction day is really, it's an option of, of last resort. Um, whenever possible, uh, we'll make sure it's safe to have our students in school with their teachers. Um, but when that's not feasible, um, it, it, and the alternative is schools closed. Uh, that's the only time we would use a remote instruction day when the alternative is that school is closed. Um, that's why we would just discuss the advantages of the remote instruction day um, and why we wanted to use that. So uh, we surveyed teachers and parents regarding their experiences with remote instruction. Um, and that's what Dr. Carnes will talk about now. Thank, Thank you, Dr. Dr. Lane. Lane. Um, like, like you mentioned, I'd like to take just a few minutes here to, 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 to go over some feedback, feedback that we received last Thursday's remote instruction. Um, we, we have, have prepared, prepared for this, this since the beginning of the school year, really, really before, year, before, 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 before that, before that knowing that it might, might be a possibility because of COVID, COVID, because of weather-related issues, and a big focus was to include times throughout the day when students would have the opportunity to learn synchronously live with their teachers. So, so after uh, uh, on Friday, Friday, we sent out a survey, uh, Dr. Wayne sent out a survey to families, and, and I'd, I'd like, like to just quickly share the feedback, feedback that we received. Um, um, so, so the first, first question had to do with technology and how well the technology worked. worked. Um, we, were we were looking for their feedback, feedback about iPads, about Teams, Zoom, Zoom um, and, and how, how well, well that went. And you can see here from the bar graph that the majority of respondents responded either four or five. And I should, I should mention that a five means everything worked as you would hope it would. Um, as a one would be that there were significant issues with the technology over the course of the day. So more than 86% of our families that responded uh, responded with a score of four or five. We then, then asked about, about synchronous, synchronous instruction, instruction and uh, asked, asked them, them to consider, consider the amount of live instruction, how would, would you rate, rate the amount of time spent in teams meetings, and, and the scale here ranged from one, one which would be too little, little to five, five which would be too much, much. three uh, would, would indicate that the families felt, felt that it was just right. right. And, and we asked ask this specific by grade band. So we have an elementary parent response chart there, middle school and high school. And you can see in each one of those, those bar graphs, the majority of respondents responded with a three, indicating that they felt that it was in, in the realm of being just right. Of course, we had some families that felt like it was too little. Uh, we, we had, had some, some other families who felt like it might have been a little too much, much and that was consistent regardless of, of the grade span. The next, the next question, question had to do with asynchronous, asynchronous instruction, that, that, that not live instruction, instruction, the assignments the teachers post, post that, that also needed to be completed as part of the uh, remote, remote instruction day. day. Same, Same scale, scale, one was too few, few. Additional, additional assignments, five, five would be too many. many. And, and again, you can see that the majority of respondents here indicated that the amount of asynchronous instruction was just right. One, one response that does stand out here is the uh, number of elementary parents who indicated uh, a four, that there may have been slightly too much asynchronous material, too many additional assignments. And that's something that we can look at with, with our teachers and, and the administration um, to figure out how to proceed. Finally, we asked for any additional thoughts or feedback. Feedback, feedback, excuse me. Um, um, there, there, there was a considerable amount, and, and, and we've looked through that, and we will continue to analyze that feedback. Many, many of the responses fell into one, one of two camps. camps. Uh, uh, there, there was there, there were some, some parents who felt like, like they would prefer an actual snow, snow day, uh, uh, let the kids enjoy the day off. off. I remember I growing up how exciting snow days are, so I understand that. that. But, but there, there were roughly, roughly an equivalent amount of parents who responded that the remote learning option is an excellent tool. It's silly to waste a warm day later in the year when we can accomplish educational objectives remotely. 
So, so like, like Dr. Lane said, said, this is not our first. first. This, this isn't what we want to do. This isn't our preference. Our preference, our preference is in-person instruction. instruction. But, but when it's necessary, necessary we feel like, like uh, things went very, very well. We also, we also asked, asked the staff similar, similar questions. We asked them how the technology worked. Um, 87% more than that. 88% of our, our teachers said that their technology worked uh, either a four or five very well. well. Uh, uh, attendance was one thing that we weren't sure what to anticipate going into this. And, and you can see from the teacher responses that 94% um, of our teachers responded that most or all of their students logged in for those synchronous opportunities, uh, which is fantastic. And, and then we asked how the schedule worked for them and their ability to accomplish instructional goals. And the vast majority indicated that the schedule was conducive to what they hoped to accomplish on that remote instructional day. So, so as a summary, summary, I just want to uh, say what a, what a fantastic, fantastic job our teachers did transitioning from in-person learning to remote instruction. instruction. That, that isn't an easy thing. thing. Uh, you, you have to prepare, prepare differently. You have to think differently about how you want to present material, what assignments you want to post, how you want to communicate with your students. Uh, and I think our teachers just did an outstanding job. Uh, the, the technology, technology worked, worked very well, well. So, so thanks, thanks to Jeremy, Jeremy and his team for making sure that we were equipped with the technology we needed, and that, and that technology worked well. well. Student attendance was excellent. The majority, the majority of our parents felt that that balance, balance of, of synchronous and asynchronous instruction was appropriate. And, and, and the, the one, one thing, thing that we're going to continue to analyze moving forward is what works best for our youngest learners. Obviously, this is easier for our middle school students and high school students in many cases, in most cases, than it is for our elementary learners. Uh, but all things considered, I think that it was, uh, it was an excellent first attempt at a remote instruction day. Does anybody have any questions? Mr. Lofton. Yeah, I'm sorry. Ask that actually, so that's more evenly distributed. Pass that one down to Steve. Oh no! Oh, wait. Oh yeah, no. There you go. Just a quick question on the slide about um, in person. Can we go back to the slide about in person from the parents? So the first of the two parent slides. Just in your analysis, I noticed one thing about um, the elementary that augments your final conclusion. If you look at the fours and fives for elementary, those are down from where they are for middle and high school. So it does seem that the parents felt like there was too little. There, were, there was a, no, a noticeable number that felt like it was too little. So that's all I just wanted to draw your attention as far as analysis, because it did seem like the elementary school students were parents were saying they need Thanks, Mr. Lawson. <laughs> Any other questions? questions? Thanks, Thanks Dr. Lawson. Yes, yes, go ahead. Just, I, I just, just real, real quick, quick uh, the fact, fact that you guys, guys uh, assembled this information, information so quickly, we analyzed it, and are figuring out how to use it for the best of their our children. children. I think you hit it so fast, and, and I, for one, am, am really thankful and, and proud you guys handled it that way. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate Thanks. And like Dr. Card said, we're going to learn from that feedback. Um, you know, as we've already talked about, uh, there's conversations for our youngest learners uh, that we need to continue to have about what's appropriate for them. Uh, conversations with Mr. Kahn about our learning support students as well um, and how to support them on this kind of day, because this, this is not an easy day uh, for them at all, uh, while also supporting our teachers through that process too. Because, you know, a remote instruction day, if you're a teacher, um, it's not like remote learning was for some schools last year when they're just planning for it week after week after week. Um, you've got a teacher who's got some content they're planning on for a Wednesday, and all of a sudden on Tuesday, they're getting told, hey, you got to trans transition this to some kind of online learning setting. That's not easy. Uh, so they did a really nice job pulling that together, and we'll continue to learn from it um, and support them through that process. Okay. Uh, the second uh, letter B there is the 22-23 calendar update. That's not a misprint. I know we've had this on here before, um, but I would like us to revisit it. I think that the folks over at ECTS... Uh, must have heard our conversation last time and Mr. Lofgren's comments um, about the day after uh, January 2nd, uh, because they went ahead and they have updated their calendar to have January 2nd as the, as the last day of winter break. 
Um, our calendar had mirrored theirs in this part of the year. It's an important, it doesn't have to 100% of the time follow that calendar, but the more often it does, the better. And that this time of year coming back from break is an important time for that because it's tough to communicate a change in schedule then. Uh, so I'm going to recommend uh, you have a, a sample calendar in your folder for 22-23 that makes the adjustment and makes January 2nd the last day of winter break um, and then puts the last day of school, I believe, on Friday, June uh, 9th. Is that the 9th, I believe? Of the school year. Yep. Questions on the calendar? Uh, no, but can I just make one quick comment? Um, if you are our guest this evening, uh, it's important to understand that our calendar most often needs to um, mirror the, uh, the tech school calendar because of all the different schools that go to the tech school. So oftentimes um, we don't have that the discretion except for the really... Uh, yeah, obviously, January second, no one should be. Uh, but that is the that that is the reality that our our calendar t follows a tech school calendar uh, for that specific reason because most of our kids go there from all the other districts. In case you all were wondering where the calendar came from. No, yeah, I don't think there'll be too many complaints about about January second being the last day of winter break, so, or for anybody. So, okay, there's no. Oh, what did we call it? What does it say? It's just blank. It's just blank. <laughs> You're going to go really late into the school year. Yes, no, that should be, no, that should be June. You're correct. I'll, I'll get a corrected version. This is the future reference, having gone through this, um, having the last day of school and commencement on the same day is pretty tough. Yeah, Jim. So, um, I wouldn't make, make any kind of recommendation to change this after all this work's been done, but that's a difficult situation to be in. Yeah, Dan and I talked, uh, we talked as an administrative team, and Dan, I, Dan and I talked about what that would look like, you know, from, from his perspective and having done it myself too. I, you're right, that's not an ideal situation for that, uh, but we're pretty confident that we can make it work for that, for that Friday night um, as, as a commencement. And I believe we were on Friday night last year too, right? But it wasn't the last day of school like that. So um, yeah, definitely hear that. And we'll consider that going forward as well. So. All right, I'm going to move to the COVID update, but I need to share my screen first. So give me one moment to do that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you can see the update now. Everybody got that? Yes. Okay. Um, for tonight's COVID update, I would like to follow a similar procedure to what we followed last month. Uh, so, to refresh your memory, I'll review our current plan. Uh, present options uh, while providing a recommendation of those options, and then allow, of course, some time for discussion at the end. Okay, so as a reminder, uh, last month we made two changes. Okay, uh, we modified the language regarding quarantine guidelines that allowed for changes to the quarantine guidelines um, and also modified and added language for the optional test to stay program uh, that we are in the very early stages of um, and started yesterday um, in all of our buildings. So I think, I think that we've had similar conversations about masking since, since early July. Um, and most of those conversations have had similar references and topics and kind of iterations each month. Um, I would suggest now, however, um, I would suggest that now in February of 22, uh, that there are some things significantly different than they were in July and August when we started having this conversation about the health and safety plan um, and masks. So let's talk about what's different. Um, there are a couple of things that are really important that were not the case this summer. Uh, first of all, first and foremost, vaccinations are available to nearly everyone ages five and up. 
Okay, that was not the case uh, when we started having conversations about the health and safety plan and what we were going to be doing uh, in schools. Um, we know that the vaccination is safe, it's effective, and it's widely available to anybody that wants it. Um, secondly, we know that the Omicron variant is significantly less dangerous and poses little risk for, stu little risk for students and children, uh, even the unvaccinated. We know that's the case for the students in the building and our adults in some cases as well. What's also different is that we have a test to stay program in place. Um, it's in its early stages. Um, it's going to get better, um, but we have that and that's an important component too, um, to our schools being safe places for our students and adults. And we also have a combination of things that didn't exist in the summer and early fall. We have a combination of like a background immunity of varying degrees, of course, depending upon the community that you're in. Um, we have a less severe virus for children in the vaccinated um, and a declining virus. All of these things, these are our new context, okay? This is a context that did not exist before, but does exist now for us, okay? Um, in particular, in terms of, just, just in terms of positive cases, I think it's meaningful to look at our case count uh, with, the, with the Omicron variant. And as you can see on the chart, we're, we're approaching in a, in a really short period of time, um, a case count in our buildings that's practically negligible. I don't wanna say it's zero, but, but it's, it's considerably smaller than anything we've seen before. And the purpose of just starting, you know, showing you this chart since we've returned from winter break is that we're talking specifically about this variant. OK, uh, we're not looking at the whole picture from the fall or into last year because variants act differently. So what we're looking at is the information here for this particular variant and what it looks like in our buildings. So you can see our overall case count there and then the count uh, for the specific buildings as well. OK, because of this, and, you know, I, I don't want this graph to necessarily be deceptive, because I think it's important and crucial to remember that th that COVID isn't gone, all right? It it's not gone from our lives. Um, it's still taking a toll in the real lives of real people um, on a regular basis in our own community. Um, but that's something I think we can anticipate that's part of our life for some time uh, moving forward. But now, I think like I've shown, in terms of what's different, we have the ability now, um, more than ever before, to keep ourselves as adults safe, okay? And our students safe in our building too, okay? So, I think the changes allow us to talk about COVID in a new way. Uh, we can have a different conversation now, given the things that are different than the conversation we've had before. All right, so what I think we have are some options, okay? I'm gonna give you three options that I see as feasible for the district. Option one, um, option one is continuing universal masking, okay? We continue masking with our current policies through March. I say through March, because that's when our next meeting is. Uh, and if we wish to revisit the health and safety plan in March, we can certainly, we can certainly do so, okay? No, that's fine. I just want to make sure it was still there. Um, option two. Okay. Um, in terms of option two, we could go down the path of optional masking. Okay. In any optional masking scenario um, that I've talked to other schools about, that you talked to the pandemic coordinator about, that you talked to any of the nurses about, even in optional masking, um, Positive cases would still follow our quarantine guidelines and household close contacts to positive cases. Uh, we see a staggeringly high number of household close contacts to close contacts to positive cases turning positive. Okay. Um, so in option two, we have an optional masking situation where positive cases we'd ask them to follow the quarantine guidelines. We would have household close contacts to positive cases continue to follow the quarantine guidelines as well. School close contacts would have options. They could follow the current, they would follow the current quarantine guidelines or utilize the test to stay program that we have in place and available in the district. It is still federal law, 
that we mask on the buses and we would have nurses masks masking in the nurses' offices as needed, because obviously that's a point where many people of varying degrees of health are coming together in one place. Um, what that looks like in the nurses' offices, depending on where their stations are, depending on what space they have around them, would look different from nurses' office to nurses' office. Okay. Option three uh, is similar to option two in a lot of ways. Uh, in option three, positive cases, again, follow quarantine guidelines. Household close contacts to positive cases continue to follow quarantine guidelines as well. Okay, so that remains the same there. Um, in this situation, school close contacts are notified. We would formally notify students and families as a district that they are a close contact at school. And we would ask them to continue to monitor symptoms um, and let them know that test to stay is available if they become symptomatic, but we would not require them to quarantine, okay? We would, of course, continue to mask on buses because that's the federal law. Uh, we would do that until that changes. We would continue to mask in the nurses' offices as needed. Oh, and I believe in both two and three. I'm sorry, I, didn't, I neglected to mention this in two. In both two and three, we would provide N95 masks to students and staff um, and make them available upon request, okay? Um, because we know the effectiveness of those masks, we would be providing those for students and staff upon request, okay? Um, what we're able to do in options two and three, um, we're in a position to prioritize uh, and take reasonable steps to focusing on learning and focusing on keeping students in school because things are now not what they were a month ago and not what they were in the fall, okay? Uh, so let's take a, a summary look at these options. Here's all three of them together, okay? Um, and I think that when you look at all three of these, even as early as this morning, uh, I was leaning toward option two, okay? Um, but after further conversations with our pandemic coordinator, um, and some of our nurses, uh, I think we, and they haven't taken a more detailed look at our building data. Um, my recommendation moving forward um, and the recommendation of the pandemic coordinator uh, would be option three, okay? Um, this is a recommendation from me and the pandemic coordinator. Um, it came in consultation with everybody here, school nurses, the solicitors, our GMEA leadership, um, and our building administration. And I think it's fair to say too, when I say, you know, we had consultation with the nurses, uh, we had a strong consensus of the nurses in support of this, but not unanimous, okay? Not unanimous, but a strong consensus, but I wanna be fair to that and make sure we know that all of those voices are represented there, okay? In option three, in optional masking, I would suggest this begins on Monday, February 28th, okay? There's a couple of reasons for that. Um, we need some time to have our test to stay program up and ready for those that want to use it. Um, if somebody wants to use it, I want to make sure we're ready to do that. Uh, we had a good start. Our folks are doing great, um, but there's just some things on the supply end and the support end that we need to iron out um, in the next two or three weeks that I would like to have ready to go. So when somebody wants to use it, it's ready to be used. It's ready to be, to be used now if we had to, and we are using it, but with real fidelity, um, we need some time to do that. We also need some time to acquire the N95 mask. We have some now, um, but we are looking at a bulk order, um, obviously to save money and time with some other districts to make sure that these are available. We have some now, but we just don't have enough now to do what we're talking about doing and making them available um, to everybody at that time. Also, if this is the recommendation we get that the board chooses to go with next week, which would be the 16th. We need a solid, to be honest, I mean, this is a big change. We need a solid week and a half to clearly communicate expectations uh, to people in the community, to the students in our buildings, and to our teacher as well. Um, that's a lot of communication for me. That's some videos, that's some letters, that's some emails, that's all of that stuff. Um, this is a change that's going to take some time to communicate effectively and effectively well. Uh, so I want to make sure we have that time. Between now and then, we'll, of course, continue to monitor our test to stay data. Uh, that we're having come in from our buildings, which I like and rely on because it's our tests, you know, that we're implementing ourselves in a controlled environment 
uh, with our folks. Uh, we'll also continue to monitor our building level data as well. Okay. Um, you know, what's in the health and safety plan now that would remain there is the pandemic coordinator's discretion. Um, if, she, if she saw something um, outrageous happening in the spring or at some point, if there was an explosion of cases in the community or in our buildings, she, in our health and safety plan now, uh, can recommend to me um, different steps be taken. And we would leave that in there now because we think that would be important as well. Um, the final recommendation is that we continue to revisit that health and safety plan as needed moving forward. Okay. Uh, questions and comments? So you're saying we're coming to the light? Um, I, I would not be the, I'm not in a position to say what the light at the end of that tunnel is, um, but what, but I will stand by what I said in that we're in a position to talk about this differently. Um, and, and I mean that sincerely, um, be, we're, and we're talking about it differently because things are different. Um, that's the reason that we can do that now. Um, and I think that for our students, for our staff, for our community, for our schools, uh, we're in a position to do that now that, that we weren't before. I think you need it. Is it off? It's on now. Okay. There I am. <laughs> Obviously, in support of the change, right? But I'm not. I'm not questioning that. Um, our handout's a little different than what's on the screen, so I'm just trying to get a clarification on option three. Mm -hmm. So I'm just zeroing in option three. Um, I, if you can pull up that slide again, because I don't have it right here. There you go. Okay. So the test to stay if symptomatic. That is a more. Con, um, it's not as complete. It's a it's a limited form of test to stay. I'm just, I'm just it's trying just to figure an out. option. That, oh. <laughs> He's it, Jeremy's trying to keep the echo from happening, so it's already turning on and off the mics. Oh, sorry, I was muting there, Jeremy. My bad. <laughs> um, no, you know, in in three, what we're doing is notifying families that they're a close contact and asking them to monitor symptoms. And if they're monitoring symptoms and see somebody symptomatic, they can use our test to stay program. Okay, but it, it, it's test to stay without that would be inclusive of a, a non-symptomatic or? So this is like a more limited test to stay? Yes, I would say so, yeah. Okay, yeah, that's, I'm just, that's the clarification I was looking for. And again, um, no, I'm in fair. favor of making there's, a change. There's also, um, it, it's just a draft. There's a draft of an updated health and safety plan in your folder too. Uh, that we can talk about recommendations for. If, the, if this is a direction we go, if we want to tweak any of that in the next week or so, we can do that as well. And that's, the, your, your printed copy of that isn't going to reflect the most recent version, the one online well. Okay. Um, now you are. Okay. Uh, we talked about this in committee. So Luke, we, tr we vetted this out pretty good. So that's how we're running our committees now is we're really talking about this stuff in detail to give you guys a level of comfort that we also talked about it. So we're not all just sitting here going, okay, we talked about this at length. Yeah. And that committee, that committee conversation was uh, Mr. Petula, Mrs. King and Mrs. Gold in that. So. Uh, yeah. May I ask, is this uh, something, I'm talking just the logistics of it. Is this something that you would anticipate bringing to us to vote next week about the end of February? Or is this something that you would, you know, I mean, where do you see it on the agenda? And then my next question is, is if we are not, you know, I, I, if anything changes, uh, could we also have like, if we needed to have an emergency meeting to say, yes, that's what we're going to, you know, we're going to make that change. Cause I don't want necessarily, I know there's a lot of space in between meetings. And so we want to make sure that if this is a change we're going to make, we can make it as soon as possible. It's best for our kids. Sure. I wanted to gauge the uh, temperature of the board on that. And if I feel that recommendation number three is option number three is the direction we're going to go. We'll formalize that on the agenda. Um, with the plan, um, the specific language in the health and safety plan and the start date for the 28th. 
Um, and what are we allowed to do? We're allowed to do a straw poll in a study session? Okay. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Can we nod our heads? Can we nod our heads informally? That, you, know, um, you know what? We tend to, uh, we, we, we listen to what Dr. Lane recommends, and I bet that he's going to present it to us in a way that uh, we're going to move forward with it. And I guess my question was, is we'll see something next. No, Brad, just one second. We'll see something yes. next week. But in addition to if we needed another opportunity, we can also call an emergency meeting meeting, you know, and, and, and do it a day, a few days early or a few days late, depending on what the administration recommends that I just wanted to make sure we were clear that that was an option. Go ahead, Brad. I'm sorry. An emergency meeting for before our next meeting. No, no, or like sorry. After. I just only meant that we're only going to vote on this potentially next week. Okay. Yes. Technically. And I know that there are like, we uh, are trying to watch this dynamic situation. And so I'm just saying to doctor, I guess what I mean to say is I'm stating to the administration and Dr. Lane that if they felt that they wanted to make a change, I, I guess we're asking is the board willing to have an emergency meeting in case next week wasn't soon enough or next week was too far away and they wanted some more time. That's it. It's a redundant question. Of course, we're going to have an emergency meeting. Andy. I would just say, while Andy's getting the microphone, that I support this uh, wholeheartedly, and I appreciate the work that Matt and the administrative team have done in regards to this. This is big. So thank you. Uh, yes, I, is it on? Yes, I do agree, Don, too, with your hard work and planning. And our pandemic coordinator agrees with this 100%. And which is also from the committee's recommendation. Very good. Thank you all. Oh, I'm so. I thought you discussed it. I did not know there was a recommendation. So here's my question. Yeah. It, it, so, and that would have, uh, I'm sorry, look, go ahead. No, I'm just a simplification for our like consensus thing. The I, while we're not take straw polls and that kind of thing. I just encourage if anybody is against it to speak up clearly, so that way they un, that way the administration understands if there's a re, if there are members that have an issue with it. That's I don't we don't take a poll, but I think we right. can make it clear that if you have an objection, speak up now. That's fair. I support option three, and I'm looking forward to going back to arguing about sports. <laughs> <laughs> No, no. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, okay, was there any more questions? Any, I was going to say, any other questions or comments on that? No, I, I think I've got the, I think I've got the general sense. And if anybody was willing, yeah, uh, wanted to speak up uh, against, they would. Um, I would also say that uh, I would just like to echo um, what's already been said about the help of everybody that is listed there um, in providing their feedback. They provided candid feedback. They provided honest feedback. Um, it was a place where we shared similar opinions, and it was a place where we shared different opinions. Um, as you can imagine, just like we have on this board, just like any organization has, uh, there's folks with different feelings about this, uh, but we had some really good conversations about it. And I learned from those conversations and they really helped shape some of the options that we have here today. Um, and I and I do wanna thank Kara Jackson, the pandemic coordinator um, for making this recommendation and helping, helping guide me through it as well. Um, in terms of what it would look like in terms of implementation. And that's something we're still working on as well. So thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. I am. Um, I'm going to move straight to D, um, which is the security presentation um, from Mr. Kanata and Officer Montez. Uh, Officer Montez uh, talked to you in September. I was trying to remember when that was. It was. It's hard to believe that it was that long ago, but it was in September. Um, and when he talked to you in September, uh, he was talking about 
policy changes related to his position. I'm just refreshing your memory. I don't know if you remember that. Uh, he talked about policy changes in, in relation to his position in the district, in addition to his vision for security and safety in the district as well. Um, he, you know, he got some feedback from you at that time, a lot of support about the direction that he wanted to take. Uh, he's done some research. He's done a lot of research um, and prepared to talk to you about kind of what's next for him um, and when he would start those things. Mr. Kanata, I hope I didn't steal too much of that. Um, but office Montez. You stole all right. of it, Dr. <laughs> Ling, but that's all right. So, uh, I'm going to turn it over to Officer Montez. Uh, just for the background, because so, we have some new board members, Officer Montez has been with us for five years now. And I think tonight he's going to present a very good plan of things are going to be very beneficial to the district in the very long term. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to him and let him start. Thank you, Mr. Kanata. Thank you, Dr. Lane. Um, thank you to the whole board for uh, providing this opportunity, a little bit of your time. I know you have a lot of important topics that you have to review, um, but thank you. Um, again, we spoke a few months back about um, the, again, the path, the, the vision that I see for uh, the safety department or safety at General McLean. Um, and this is kind of a, a, the next step as far as providing a little bit of additional information for you. Um, you have, aside from this presentation, you have copies, uh, you can see it displayed here on screen, um, but you also should have copies of the formal uh, or longer proposal um, and this presentation and some supporting documents as well. So the, those should be uh, in your folder to follow along if needed. Um, I know time is limited, so I'll try to be as efficient as possible with my 47 slides that we have to cover here. <laughs> but um, I'll go ahead and get started here. Um, let's Jeremy, are you displaying? Okay, thank you. Um, so again, today I, I'm looking to um, speak to you a little bit about this more in depth and also uh, try to obtain uh, formal, I guess, approval to obtain the uh, what I'm going to need as a my certification to establish myself as a school police officer and also transition what we have as our safety department into what would be a formalized uh, school police department. Um, as you can see here, this is just a testimony to how serious General McLean and you as a board take safety. Um, so prior to 2007, there was no officer. Uh, in 2007, uh, Deputy Haggerty joined us after joining the, the Sheriff's Office. Uh, in 2017 is when I came on board, uh, still uh, attached to the Erie County Sheriff's Office. And most recently in 2020, is when uh, we created the position for the school uh, officer for General McLean, uh, which is what I hold now. And hopefully uh, with the vision of two, uh, 2022 and beyond to create that position as a General McLean school police officer. So this, uh, this slide here uh, kind of breaks down what NASRO, which is the National Association of School Resource Officers, um, calls a triad model. So I, I model a lot of the work that I do in the school district based off of this. Um, it's three, it's three sections to it um, and not in any specific order, but one of them being the educator. So I think having that law enforcement background and staying up to date with law enforcement process is key to this part. Um, and a lot of the material uh, comes from that process. So a lot of the material that I use to have uh, uh, guest presentations in classrooms, um, those vary all the way from kindergarten to uh, 12th grade. Uh, some of those are listed there, bullying, cyberbullying, internet safety, uh, all the way down to some of my more uh, popular ones being the DUI stuff. Uh, we have We get to do some activities with the students and have them do uh, the standardized field sobriety testing with the drunk goggles, so that's always fun. Um, the middle section there breaks down what is called the informal counselor. So there's a lot of great benefits uh, that come out of this, uh, part of it being uh, information to maintain safety throughout the school district. So some type of tip, if there's any type of uh, problem going uh, between two students, um, sometimes other students coming forward and providing some information will help diffuse that before it uh, turns into anything more severe. 
or it, it even if it's something a little bit more serious, like a threat of any type, a lot of the times having those connections with students allows us to uh, be able to stop any type of potential threat before it actually happens. Um, and lastly, the law enforcement, the law enforcer, the least favorite, I think, for any good school resource officer is having to enforce any type of law. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, sometimes it does happen. Uh, the benefit of having a school based police officer um, is that we have the, the background knowledge of certain incidents or certain things that occur with uh, with any student. Um, that way we can take all that into account to be able to come up with the best plan to deal with uh, the student or any type of incident opposed to a road uh, police officer uh, that would might be responding to the school district wouldn't have that information um, and would simply treat the incident as a as a black or white so no in between um, which sometimes isn't as beneficial for the student So this next slide here breaks down what the overview of school officer positions are. Um, the first section there is a school resource officer. So that's an officer or a deputy that's attached to a school district while still being a, an employee of the police department or sheriff's office. Um, so that's like Deputy Haggerty and myself when I was a deputy, that's how I was um, in that position. The middle position is the school safety officer or school security guard, which is our current position with the 235 uh, certification. And lastly, the school police officer, which is hopefully the end goal. Um, I'd like to take your attention to those highlighted sections to note the differences and the importance of those differences. Um, the school resource officer one um, can detain and arrest um, like the school police officer as well. And the school security officer can only temporarily detain but not arrest. Um, going further down, uh, the school resource officer can issue citations, um, can issue any type of, whether it's traffic or non-traffic. Um, the school security officer has no authority to cite or charge. Um, the school police officer, just like the SRO, can actually charge as well. So again, going back to something that we noted previously, um, that's very important. Um, due to the fact that if, if we feel that we have to deal with a certain incident in-house, a certain way to get the most benefit for the student, um, that might not be seen the same way by an outside responding law enforcement agency. So again, uh, the school resource officer is limited to outside law enforcement agency standard operating procedures. So meaning they have a standard of how they should deal with certain incidents. Um, so that might tie the school resource officer's hands um, a little bit with dealing with anything. Um, and moving over to the school security officer, um, there's that position has no say with how uh, law enforcement response might disposition or deal with any type of incident. So uh, it would be directly up to the responding trooper or officer. So here are some of the objectives um, that I, I think would be beneficial to that position. Um, so incident management, um, it's very important to be able to have the discretion to be able to view any type of incident through a school-based officer's lens. Um, that way we can take everything into consideration uh, to be able to disposition any, any type of incident. So again, an outside officer might not have that same either mindset or even training as far as adolescent mental health um, or how we would normally deal with things in a school setting. And moving over to the situational awareness, so that all that information listed there, um, I believe is key to be able to have an overall uh, understanding of what's going on and how we can best address issues that might come up. And uh, lastly, to note on the last column there, um, NASRA, again, National Association of School Resource Officers, uh, does recommend that there would be at least one SRO per 1,000 students. Um, other things to consider with that are the size, uh, the size of the school district, um, the, dis the distance between buildings, things of that nature. Um, but as a rule of thumb, it's one per 1,000 students. 
So this is just a quick snapshot of the steps that would need to be taken uh, to start this process. Um, we would need to uh, get a certification number, be sworn in by a judge, acquiring an ORI to establish that police department and uh, continue. Again, we have uh, various MOUs, memorandums of understanding or agreement between other our General McLean School District and other agencies, but there would just need to be an updated one and an additional one with a 911 center and with the Pennsylvania State Police. So next slide here is our funding. Um, we already have, again, like I said, General McLean and this board has always taken safety very seriously. And you've shown that with, uh, with the commitment that you made uh, to have me in this current position. So I'd like to note that a lot of uh, the investment has already been made in that. Um, but some of the additional things uh, would be the cost of the Act 120 Academy and additional uh, testing that has to be done with that. Here are some of the, those immediate goals to make that happen. Um, again, it's a Mercyhurst application, Act 120 Academy application, uh, an information session, and various small tests that um, would have to be uh, done by myself. And uh, lastly here, I have Mr. Rick Skanetska, sorry. Um, he is a current Act 120 Academy instructor. Um, he's had various roles uh, in different uh, law enforcement agencies as well. Um, so he is here available if you have any questions pertaining to uh, the, the Act 120 process. But um, that's, I know I went through that pretty quickly, um, but like I said, you do have a lot of that information with you, but I wanted to uh, take this opportunity to be able to uh, kind of hopefully set the picture for you. That way you understand what you're, what you're looking at a little bit clearer um, and then have this opportunity to answer any questions you might have. Not through the microphone, but yes. Can you hear me now? I can. This is a Verizon. <laughs> um, I have a couple questions. Um, with the additional training, um, there's going to be considerable time away from school, and how will that be covered? And my second question is, can you address, and maybe you can at this point, but I think we as a board need to understand how we pay for this uh, because we do have some serious budget concerns. Does this change our grant possibilities or funding opportunities at all? Um, actually, the, the funding aspect, and I would have to be more familiar with what you're currently doing, um, but as far as th establishing this police officer role and department actually opens up um, the availability of some of those opportunities. Um, right now with my Act 235 capacity, um, I'm not able to, or we're not able to apply for some of those things. Um, being in that role, that would open up some of those and give us the availability to at least attempt to get them and apply. Um, as far as the, um, the training um, and my availability here, um, that would run into a couple of the fall months. Um, the academy would start, I believe, June 5th, and it goes to about December. Um, so there would be a couple uh, weeks, months there um, that I wouldn't be able to be here. Um, but that, I think, is something that we could figure out logistically um, to have some type of rotation with additional uh, officers, just like we treat any other uh, additional athletic events or events happening in the district. Hope that clears that up a little bit. I just, I just wanted to say I appreciate the investment and work that you've done in putting this proposal together. I think this shows for GM um, how we work to pick people that are motivated and work to improve the options that we have available at GM. So I appreciate the work that you put into this. Thank you. I appreciate that.
You mean like uh, credit reimbursement? Yes, we do. Yeah, we talked about, um, I mean, uh, Officer Montez is outside of the collective bargaining agreement, which obviously is where that language is for reimbursement. Um, but um, in terms of, you know, funding for paying for uh, the training, like Mrs. King was asking and funding it back in September, uh, Mrs. Isard at that time had recommended uh, some options for funding through grant funding. And Mr. Kanata and Dr. Carnes and Officer Montez looked at some of those. And as Officer Montez said, um, his current role made him ineligible for a lot of those. Uh, that would change uh, potentially um, so, or significantly with, with, with the change in role in the district. Um, so would he be eligible for direct credit reimbursement through the collective bargaining agreement program? No, um, but there could be conversations about other ways, I guess. Dr. Uh, Officer Montez, uh, may I ask this? Um, did I hear you correctly that although there uh, maybe there's some upfront costs, which I, I mean, you are going to probably work through with Bill or whatever, but you're tough. Did you just say that if once you had that certification that the district would then be eligible for other grants and other things in the future? Yeah, so th with the different positions, like uh, I broke down the school resource officer position, how you're attached to an outside agency. The school police officer is a standalone uh, school police department. Those two positions are eligible for certain types of funding. Um, so yes, if I go through this, establish the school police officer position and the police department, that would open up some avenues uh, to uh, try to get these the, the funding. Because I do think that one of the things that Mrs. Eisert, the point was, is that there's a lot of grants that are out there that, that could be written for school safety. Yeah, I believe some of those are like the safe schools grants and things of that nature. But some of the requirements for those are that it, it's either of the two different positions, not the one that I currently hold. Um, just, I think for the board, we've got a handout on page 10. I think these are the costs that an estimate of the costs on page 10 of the handout that we got. Is that correct? Yeah. Um, are you looking at the written proposal? Yep. Yes, sir. Yep. Okay. So just to know that we have those numbers, but then would there be one additional number, which would be the amount of, um, in that fall period you were talking about us needing to hire somebody potentially just to be on campus while you're, so we need maybe to add a number on what but yes, we would. Um, again, we could talk to the the frequency, uh, the rotation of officers, the hours, all that stuff would make it fluctuate. So yep. No, yep. just I just appreciate you putting the cost together. Yes. Just real quick, and, and maybe Bill can answer this is uh, because of the nature of the uh, previous um, uh, program that we were under, maybe even going to the county for those fill-in days, they still offer kind of like substitutes. I, I would assume that there might even be some play there if we needed to, or I'm sure you'll have it under control, but is that like one of the resources? So there would be seamless for security in our buildings. That's yeah, absolutely. And whether it's that or um, outside organizations that we use with the officers that are trained and have the certifications, uh, we would definitely have that pre-planned and ready to go so that there is a seamless transition. Yeah. There's options, I guess you're confirming. That. Absolutely. Thank you. Yes. Thank you very much. I, and maybe we should clarify that on page 10. And Jose, I'm sorry if I jumped in where you were going to go. The in-house resources on the bottom are things we've already paid for. Correct. Yeah, so it, whether you're looking at this on the on the screen down here or, or on the formal proposal, 
uh, there is a list of things that are already uh, here at General McLean. So things like the the outfitting of the officer with the the appropriate gear and equipment, uh, the vehicle, all those things are already things that General McLean has invested in. We have here, so th that's not an additional expense. That's not. <laughs> no, what we're, yeah, you're talking about change in salary costs. No, we're just talking about tonight the idea that those two totals there, the total or the total without radios are the cost that really this would have. It, I mean, he would change it in designation in terms of what his role is. We hadn't talked about a salary change. Though. And that's what you're asking. That's what you're asking, right? Yeah. Good point. If that we we will we will include that if that's part of that calculation we need to. Yep, no problem. So making sure I heard everything correct, you 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 want to know the coverage of the hours of the time that I'm away. They are daytime hours. Yeah, daytime hours Monday through Friday. Um, so yeah, we we could definitely develop a plan to have that so you could look at that. Yeah. No. <laughs> I think I feel comfortable about that too. Uh, the only thing I the only thing I um, say to that is I think it would be fair to Jose if we talked about like specifics about you know days and times and stuff. It may be tough for him to put a name to that no, at, at this point. No, I mean he would need no, just the concept, just the idea, exactly. the idea of the coverage though, right? Yeah. Is what you're talking about. Right. Okay, like yeah. when I went to grad school and I had to do internships, I had to tell my employer. What I, what was going to happen with my job while I was mm -hmm. doing my internship? Yep. That's all. Fair. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah, and I I just like to reiterate the value that he you know I know you know this but you know getting to see it in action, um, you know sure he's a, a highly trained. Um, individual and professional when it comes to safety and security, but it's a unique skill set to do that and also be an educator um, at, at the same time. Um, and to talk about an understanding of adolescent, adolescent development, uh, pre adolescent development, all of those things, and understanding um, kids in certain situations, uh, we really value Jose and what he brings to the district. So just wanted to echo that and thank you, Jose. Thank you. You're No, not the, not tonight. No, you can you can send them to me, and, and I'll and I'll answer them now. Okay, no problem. Uh, moving down to E, um, the PA Auditor General. Um, as I noted in my board update this week, um, we, the district benefited from the luck of the draw, um, <laughs> and was selected for a performance on it from the state. Um, lucky us. Um, but that, that audit will cover um, July 1st, 2016 uh, to June 30th, 2020, okay, is the period covered by the audit. So once again, that's July 1st, 2016 to June 30th, 2020. Um, districts are selected for the, you know, these audits randomly um, or on a cycle. So it's fortunately or unfortunately our turn. Um, the audit covers a lot of topics. I, I sent you the opening letter uh, so that you could see it. Uh, things like internal controls, financial stability, contract management, bus driver qualifications, transportation data, school safety, teacher certification, um, and the list goes on. Um, in addition to myself, uh, the auditors 
They'll spend time with our registrar. Uh, they'll spend time with our director of curriculum, our transportation supervisor, Officer Montez, the board secretary, and others. Uh, these folks that I've just listed um, have already put in a lot of time just in the last week uh, getting PDE the information they need. I mean, PDE is interesting. You know, they, they, they tell you on a Thursday uh, that they would like to meet next week. Um, yet if we ever reached out to them in a request for something in that kind of turnaround, we don't seem to have it reciprocated. They uh, return your call. <laughs> so, um, but we've been accommodating. And as Mr. Fenda kind of noted with them in our first meeting um, with them, that even with current staffing changes that we have, um, it's really tough for us to get the things that they're looking for in the time that they want it, but we've done that so far. Um, you know, but it's been a tough ask and we shared with them, they asked, are there any extenuating circumstances for any of these situations? And, you know, like Bill said, other than a pandemic going on and us being extremely <laughs> short staff, not, not really. Um, but they've still been impressive in terms of their ability to get him the, get them the information they need. Okay. Uh, so we expect, uh, the audit to last, you know, beginning to end several months. Um, the audit results will, of course, be shared with the board along with the steps that we'll take um, as a district regarding any recommendations uh, that they'll have. But that's just getting started, and I will keep you updated. Do they come updated. on site, or do you do it all virtual? Uh, there are three folks. Two um, are remote. One is local from Mill Creek, um, but even she is doing things remotely for so far for the most part but she is local there's one of one of the three are local it'll take months yes it'll, it'll be months before you i'll try i mean we'll keep you updated throughout um but any questions or comments on that uh, the last uh audit that we received was five years ago correct and uh and the this is just kudos to our district and our leadership who uh is maintaining things so well that there was the one thing that we got noted on bill do you remember what it was clearances <laughs> but it was like a redundant form that like yeah. was absolutely it was like completely redundant that we didn't need to do and it was the only thing that they noted and they said because they had to find a deficiency so kudos to general mclean and the leadership that kept us in straight you know, we get through an audit with, they, they had to catch us with a catch 22 form that was absolutely redundant. So. Good. Any other questions, comments? All right, with that being said, I'll turn it over to uh, Mr. Fenda for the 2022-2023 budget first look. Okay, I am going to try to share my screen here. Yes, well, uh, the, the presentation that I'll do here tonight is all in the binder. And there is additional information that's in the binder that is not in the presentation tonight. So... Uh, all right here we go so yes this is um the the first look at the budget for 2022-23. And being that it is the first look, um, as you know, there will be a lot of changes between now and May or May or June when the final budget is approved and submitted to the state. Um, for those of you who have been here the past few years, we've done uh, typically done the first look in, at the March meeting. So we're a month earlier this year. Uh, and one of the reasons for that is we think that we may want to have some committee meetings between now and May to discuss options uh, to address the budget. Uh, so that's why we're about a month earlier. Uh, 
so that's going to that's on the plus side that'll give us some more time to work on the budget uh, on the downside uh this first look is um a little hazier because we uh number one we didn't have the governor's state budget uh, address until yesterday. We got the numbers for subsidies this morning. So those numbers are not included in what you're going to see tonight. Uh, we, for, for this purpose, uh, we've, we've assumed that the state subsidies are flat from this year to next year. So just, that's just a quick background here. Um, timeline of what we're looking at. Uh, tonight is the first look. Uh, March uh, I'd like to set a meeting with the subcommittee to talk about setting the mins and maxes for non-instructional like we did last year. Uh, between now and May, we'll have ad hoc meetings with uh, primarily the, the finance committee meeting, but possibly soliciting community input on uh, the budget and uh, looking at, at different options that we have to address uh, some of the issues we're facing in the budget. Uh, tentatively, we'd like to approve the, I'm sorry, adopt the proposed final budget at the April study session with a limited agenda meeting. And then uh, if all goes well, adopt the final budget at the May voting meeting. Uh, there's a number to look at. And tonight, uh, that's the best, uh, the best guess I can give you at the bogey number that we're looking at to try to either increase our revenues long term and or reduce our expenses long term. So uh, you're going to see uh, we, we have some deficit numbers to look at, and uh, that's just a number to keep in mind as we move forward between now and June. Okay, so here's the first look. Uh, our 21-22 projection, that's for this year. Um, and there's a, a, a footnote A here. These numbers, the revenues and expenditures and transfers do not include the ESSER or the ARP funds, the federal grant monies. Um, those, I just felt that those numbers uh, since they're included in both revenues and expenses, and they might be in one year and not the other, uh, it tended to create confusion for me and everyone. So uh, I've just taken those out so that we can focus on district expenditures. And those numbers have no impact whatsoever on the surplus or the deficit because the money comes in and the money goes out. So there's really no sense to muddy the waters with, with those federal monies. Um, footnote B also, there is no tax increase. Um, I did not want to make any assumptions. So there's no tax increase included in the 22-23 budget. And you see there uh, for this year, looking at a projected $3.2 million deficit for 22-23, $4.3 million deficit. Uh, now, I'll mention here for the projection, for purpose of the projection, um, the, the past several years, I took a look at our expenditures, our actual expenditures versus our uh, budgeted expenditures, and we've been uh, very diligent and very fortunate to be coming in actual expenses less than the budget. And uh, we've we've run anywhere from a million dollars to a million and a half. So, for purpose of this projection, I felt comfortable taking a million dollars out of expenses without knowing specifically what that would be. Um, we do know that we include uh, some hedges in the budget, uh, contingencies, and hedges. Um, to uh, make sure we're covering the worst case. So that's why um, we, we know pretty much each year and so far we've always been under budget on our, our spending. Uh, I did not do that 
I did not take anything out of the expenditures for 22-23 budget. So what you see is what you get there. Uh, fund balance, again, projection and budget. Uh, at the beginning of this year, we started 13.7 million um, with the, the projection and the budget flowing through the, the fund balance. Uh, we would be looking at 6.2 million by the end of 22-23. Uh, so the big question is, how long does that last? How long does that fund balance last? Is it two years? Is it three years? I uh, don't know. So I've heard some people ask, and particularly when we um, we had a citizens advisory committee in the fall of this year to look at our budget situation, our financial status, and some people asked, "Well, how did we get here?" I looked at you know I presented some graphs of history and you know, revenues and expenses and fund balance and the whole business. And uh, people would ask, well, why is it that all of a sudden it seems like we're, we're in this position? Well, uh, first of all, it, it's not really all of a sudden. Um, anyone who was here before I started at General McLean may remember uh, when Mr. Fox was the business manager, he did some projections uh, saying that our fund balance would be exhausted by mid uh, mid decade like 24 25 so um, i don't know if that's coincidence or a testament to his ability to forecast numbers but we're still looking at the same possibility today so what's what's been done uh, in the school district um i i feel and we feel that the uh, the district has has done things to control spending over the past decade um, as, as everybody knows, salaries, wages, and benefits um, account for now 75% of a school district budget, uh, and those costs have largely been controlled. I took a look at over 10 years from 2010-11 to 2019-20, our total wages, looked at those wages over the course of 10 years, and the average increase to that line item has been 1.25%. Really shocked me that it was that low because we know uh, that increases to salaries and wages have been early in that, that decade, they were in the 5 to 6% range. So how could that be? Well, it's through attrition, through eliminating positions, um, and the things that were, the actions that were taken during that time period are listed here. There were 16 and a half teaching positions eliminated, three administrative positions, secretar secretarial positions, groundskeeper, uh, building grounds supervisor. There was voluntary pay freezes by administrators for one year and by bus drivers for three years. Uh, and then uh, when the ACA, the healthcare, um, law went into effect. Uh, there were limits put on uh, part-time employee hours so that the district was not incurring uh, health care costs. So those are all, uh, you know, just some of the things, a snapshot of the things that have been done within the district to control expenses. And, um, you know, as I said, I was shocked myself with the, the salary and wage numbers and um, pleasantly surprised, actually. Uh, and then there's also some other things not related to salaries and wages that were done, health care plan changes. Uh, we got better terms, lease terms on copiers. Uh, lighting and HVA system, systems were upgraded to um, realize energy savings. And uh, the teachers had agreed to higher health care contributions. We consolidated bus runs, all sorts of things. There were some programs that were run by the IU. We brought those in-house at one time, some of the programs, uh, and saved some costs there. In the meantime... <laughs> There's something that we have fondly referred to as the big three. Um, the first of these 
is an underfunded state mandate. So contributions to the state pension system during this time period from 2010 to 2019-20, this district has made $32.4 million in payments and received 18.7 million in subsidies, which means the district share 13.7 million over that time period. Number two out of the big three, special education expenditures, same story, 35.3 million in payments, 19.6 in subsidies, 15.7 district share. And number three, tuition to cyber charter schools, 6.9 million paid, and uh, something that rounds to less than about $100,000 because we no longer get any subsidy for this. Uh, we did early in the the decade, but not anymore. So the district has incurred 6.8 million in cyber charter school costs. And uh, that does, doesn't even include a million from last year because so, I cut this off at 1920. Just a, just a point of clarification there, just um, the subsidies for a charter student, I think it would be more accurate to include the basic education as one of the subsidies from the state. I know that we get that, whether that student comes here or goes to cyber, but I think that that should be, if you're wanting to compare, it would be appropriate to do a proportional amount of the basic education subsidy as part of what is used for the cyber. You must have looked ahead like two or three slides here. Okay, well, I was lucky. <laughs> <laughs> but you're right. You're right, Luke. Uh, absolutely. Um, so the big three, $36.2 million over 10 years. That's more than our annual budget in, for one year. That is what has been forced on the district by the state without appropriate subsidy or payments. Not just our district, every district in the state. Yes. So that's that was the total cost over that period of time. Now, I just want to switch briefly to the increases in those three line items, the, the, the big three, as we call them. Uh, 5.1 million more than 1011. And now let's look at increases to our real estate tax collections and basic ed subsidies, as Mr. Lofgren pointed out, right on the money. Um, we have real estate taxes and state basic ed funding, <coughs> excuse me, that have increased. These are just increases. Uh, by 2.8 million during that time period, and 2.2 2 million dollars uh, of basic ed funding. The, the sum of those two is 4.8 million. And if I went back to that previous slide, it was five point something million. So our local real estate taxes increases and the basic ed funding increases have not even been enough to cover the increases in those other costs. Uh, let's see. I think I flipped forward one too many. Here we go. Uh, I mentioned earlier, we had a citizens advisory committee. We had nine members of the community who agreed to meet with us, look at the status of our budget. Um, this, was, this was all in the fall of uh, 2021. And, <coughs> excuse me, they came away, as a group, they came away with uh, three recommendations in order of priority. <coughs> <laughs> Three um, ideas or recommendations to generate more revenues. 
Uh, one is to seek, seek grants that are available for recurring costs. We touched on that a little bit as Officer Montez was talking. Um, consistent incremental tax increases, incremental meaning rel relatively small. Uh, allow advertising on campus. Uh, so those were the top three from the committee as a whole. And then some other rec recommendations you can see there, uh, things ranging from rent space in our buildings, um, offer online students to non I'm sorry, online programs to non-district students. Wow. Some uh, ideas for YouTube, Spotify, Venmo type things, um, reminders to um, residents to donate through estate planning, uh, for the district to appeal assessed values of properties that are sold, and then um, the fees for extracurricular activities. That has come up periodically over the years. On the flip side, recommendations to control expenses, uh, the top three in order of priority were, I'm sorry, sorry, I just lost my computer, but it's, okay, still on the screen, I guess. Uh, the top three there, uh, delay turf replacement, and um, ex um, explore energy efficiency options, and then uh, expand General McLean's cyber school offerings. Uh, and then other, there were a number of other, um, a number of other recommendations that were in, in no particular order but uh, included contracting services uh, such as food service, transportation, custodial, uh, increasing employee uh, contributions for healthcare, employee pay freezes, uh, staff reductions, uh, combining elementary schools um, and, and so forth. So there's- Did something happen with the presentation? Yeah, I'm gonna have to try to. See if I can get this back. Okay, it's Ron in here. We can go to the folder if we want. Here, let's watch it too. It's like yes. three. I'm sorry, I'm, no, I'm just uh, having to reboot my okay. machine here. Second. Second. I think I'll I'm there. Okay. Back in business. Okay. Uh, this is where we were. Uh, I just want to touch on real estate tax as a perspective here. Um, uh, I touched on the, the increases that have uh, in real estate taxes and, and how those combined with the increases in the basic ed funding were not enough to cover the, um, the increases in the big three. Uh, real estate taxes, uh, there is a law in place. The school board cannot increase real estate taxes by more than what's called the, the Act 1 index without voter approval. So this district's index has ranged from 3.1 to 4% during the past six years. And the actual increases have been 1.25%, 0, 0 0.8%. 
one, zero, and two for those six years, which is an average of 0.84%. So um, I just want to show an example of uh, the power of compounding. And uh, if, if there had been a 2% a year increase for six years versus that 0 0.84. So the 2% is somewhere in the middle of the, uh, the range for our maximum. Uh, there would have been $5.3 million generated in revenue. And the actual revenue generated was $2.1 million. So that was, um, uh, the, the power of compounding would have generated $3.2 million additional revenues. And this slide shows how that works um, because each year, if there had been, for instance, um, if the bottom, the bottom of the screen, the actual tax increase, there was an increase that generated $169,000 in 2016-17. In and that has been in, in place. Um, that's realized every year once the increase is in, in place. So that's been in place for the, the six years. And then 1819 was the next increase. So there was 112,000 generated. That's been in place since then, and so on and so forth. And that's how the $2 million is generated. At the top, uh, that if there had been a theoretical 2% increase each year, uh, that would generate roughly $250,000 and it's building on itself each year. Uh, it's a little bit like compound interest when you put your money in the bank and uh, the money accumulates, it earns some interest and the next year there's interest on the interest and so on and so forth. So what can be done? Uh, go home and call and write and text your state legislators and tell them to do more about the unfunded or underfunded mandates that are killing every school district in Pennsylvania. That would be the number one recommendation coming out of this meeting. Um, options, um, other options listed below, and I want to emphasize and stress for everyone out there, these are not decisions or recommendations, they are simply options. Uh, and they are options that may be shocking to some people, some of these, uh, but they would have the greatest financial impact in the long term. Important to, to notice here that um, most of these would have to be long term, meaning beyond the 2022 23 budget year. Um, and you can see there, there's it, one option would be to close a school building, another would be to close two school buildings. Uh, that couldn't happen the way we're structured right now. There's not enough space. Uh, but if, for instance, there was a, uh, a voluntary GM cyber program that attracted 25% of our students, maybe we could fit the remaining 75% in two buildings. Staff or program reductions, eliminate athletics from the district budget. Um, it, the district's been moving that direction. The boosters have been very good about picking up uh, more and more of the expenses. Uh, contract or eliminate transportation um, and increase real estate taxes. Those are, as I said, um, undesirable things that no one wants to do or talk about. Uh, those are also things that would generate the kind of savings or revenues that uh, may be needed if nothing uh, changes in terms of state revenues or relief from mandates or uh, things like that. So.
Uh, what's next? Um, as I mentioned, we, we will have uh, finance committee me meetings scheduled. We're going to talk about some of these options. Uh, we'll identify anything that can be done in the short term, meaning for this fall and for the 2022-23 budget year. And then uh, start to prioritize some of the ideas that we have for revenue and expense options uh, for 22-23, I'm sorry, 23-24 and beyond. And uh, as I said, maybe to do some surveys, solicit input from the community and uh, start to formulate a plan so that um, this district doesn't go down the road of um, what the Erie School District had to, to go through a few years ago. Questions? Yes. There, there is no requirement to provide transportation. Even in a rural district like ours. Right. No. Well, I remember we looked into selling the buses and going private. We did that, I don't know, maybe six years ago. And that's a one-time shot in the arm. And then you end up with all this expense. And the districts that did it when we talked about it are regretting it now. So it's tough. I appreciate our bus system the way it is now. So I, just, I appreciate all the, all the efforts of our bus drivers and the administration of the bus system. They're doing a great job. <laughs> Exactly. I, I, I would not be in favor. I'm not in favor of, of contracting in general. It's simply an idea. As I said, not a recommendation. Okay, thank you for your attention. Bill, I just, I feel, I, I feel like I'm on repeat every year saying this, but I'm going to say it again. Um, I just feel like we have to have a balanced approach to how we approach our expenses. And I've never felt comfortable with the fact that A, you know, we're a, hopefully a perpetual organization, meaning we're gonna be here for a long time. And I, as a business person, I don't grasp the fact that we have no debt. That makes absolutely no sense to me. Never has, it never will. I'll never agree with it. When we have I'm, long I'm sorry, but I, I didn't quite hear that last sentence. Never have, never will agree with it. No debt. No debt. She doesn't debt. understand why no we debt. have to. Oh, it makes I'm no sorry. sense yeah, to me as hear. a business person that we don't have any debt. I know people think that's a great thing. Personally, that's a great thing. But as an organization that has long-term assets that we have to maintain, upgrade, and handle, the debt service on that, to spread that out over many years makes much more financial sense as an organization to me. Others can have a lot of different opinions, but I really think we have to look at multiple different things. Five things aren't going to answer our budget issues, and I know you you agree with that. Well, I didn't see any of that. Uh, the, yeah, the, there will be a uh, resolution next week on the agenda um, related to a bond issue. Uh, and the resolution basically will allow us to uh, reimburse the district for expenses that we are incurring for some of those big capital projects um, once we uh, issue the bonds and get the proceeds. So that we may have to lay out some cash, but then we can we can reimburse ourselves once the bonds are sold. So, so I feel like we're going there. Yeah, and so yes, like there, the there will be uh, debt, debt issues 
and I have a I have a preliminary uh, proposal from the financial advisors that we can go over. We'll, we'll go over it at the March meeting. Uh, we've we met with them a couple times already, and uh, Mr. McDonald's office is getting involved as well. So we're, we're going to have a proposal. All of these. There's a lot of things swirling around in the background that I didn't touch on in the presentation, but uh, a debt issue is one of them. And then all of the the big building projects with the HVAC, the rooftop units, the roof replacements, the fuel tanks that we've talked about um, too many times, and, uh, and and other miscellaneous product projects, the turf replacement and, and things like that. So. Uh, you're absolutely right. There, there is discussion going on in the background about a debt issue. Thank you for clarifying. I appreciate it. <laughs> uh, I just want you to know, I, I did not set that up as a prop. Right. Exactly. <laughs> for this meeting. No. <laughs> For Bill or any other questions or concerns, Bill, did you have anything else for that presentation? I can't think of anything else. As I said, the the binders have uh, much more information. They they have. Uh, the graphs that you're used to seeing in the past, uh, this year the presentation was quite a bit different than what I've tried to do in the past, but um, the information that you've seen in prior years is included in that uh, binder, and it has a, the three years, the current budget year, the projection for this year, and next year's budget with all the details you could pro possibly want included in that. Thank you, Bill. Thank you. All right, we're going to go into the uh, monthly agenda review. Thank you. The policy and co-curricular committee met before the meeting tonight. So some of this will be a condensed summary. Um, and when we reference things that uh, can be discussed in executive, um, I think they can be uh, discussed in executive in terms of just like if there's items there you have questions about, uh, feel free to ask us then. Otherwise, we'll provide uh, the summaries as needed. So if you take a look at the agenda, uh, for policy and co-curricular, number one, we have the second and final reading for policy 006 and 903, which we discussed last month at length. Tonight in committee, we reviewed 610, 611, 626, and 336 as well. 610, 11, and 26 are all related to purchasing um, in designation of different people in different roles and amounts. We talked about those in detail in committee. Items three, Can, four, can I pause you just a second, just for oh, clarification? Sorry, go ahead. One of the things I've realized is that sometimes the community doesn't realize these draft policies are available on our website, on the policy mm -hmm. website, and they can select in the upper right corner to see drafts, just to know that the, that the community can review these policies very easily online. Yeah, that's a good reminder, because I share them with you and our stuff, but that's a good reminder of where they are publicly as well. Okay, uh, three, four, five, and six um, are items that we can uh, discuss in executive, if you wish. Uh, number seven is the approval of the field trip to New York City uh, for Mr. Yates and General McLean High School students. Um, number eight is the approval of the updated health and safety plan, uh, which we can provide more detail now that I have a little bit of guidance on that. Um, and then number nine is an approval of PDE signatures resolution, which allows me uh, to use e-signature on the e-grants page for all of our fund, uh, federal funds rather than having them send me hard copies of those. Since we're voting on number seven, the field trip, could we just adjust the motion to say that it will reflect the requirements in New York City at the time in case those change? I'm sorry, what are they? 
number seven B. Yeah. It says that, you know, we're basically, we're saying it is going to be required, but if that changes by then, could we just modify it to say that it'll be required only if the destination requires it? I'm just writing that down. Yeah, we obviously as a district don't have a vaccination requirement for field trips. It's just the destination does for where for where those so kids are going and all the stuff they're doing. No, that's a good recommendation. Yeah. Um, that takes us to finance and district operations. So, uh, item one on uh, finance and district operations is um, for consideration of the Erie County Tech School budget for 2022-23. And uh, I believe there was a copy of that in your packets for board members. Um, and uh, the, the district share, uh, proposed district share would be uh, the district share would be three hundred thirty nine thousand seven hundred thirty three dollars, which is actually less than twenty uh, twenty one twenty two. The total budget for the tech school would be six million nine hundred sixty six eight thirty five. Uh, which is which is an increase in total for the tech school of four hundred three thousand twenty five dollars from year to year, and then number two is the resolution I mentioned earlier, which uh, would allow the district to reimburse itself a maximum of fifteen thousand I'm sorry fifteen million dollars of bond proceeds for cash outlays associated with the various um, building projects including uh, the tech school renovations uh, and miscellaneous other capital projects. And then the rest of the items on uh, finance and district operations are personnel that will be discussed in the executive. All right, and then we'll move on to curriculum and instruction. Um, item one is the consideration of ratification of additions to our substitute teacher list. Uh, the individuals listed all went through the training at the IU. Item number two is consideration of ratification of an intermittent FMLA leave as listed. Um, consideration in number three, consideration of ratification of the long-term substitute at GM High School as listed. Item number four is consideration of approval of retirement as listed. And then number five is consideration of approval of the update to the 2022-2023 calendar, um, as Dr. Lane described in the reports. I think she has enough years and she's free to go. I was going to say, that's a... Uh, in terms of recommendations for tonight, that can obviously, we'll discuss that more at length what, next week, but that recommendation from the administration is a no on number four, obviously, <laughs> hard no. So she has to serve without pay. Um, we get that to Skeletta. <laughs> we uh, are now going to, the board is going to convene to uh, an executive session in a, probably the same location we were the last time. We will have a, an executive session session related to employment issues, personnel, and legal consultation. Uh, this is not a voting meeting. We will not be coming in for any back in for any other discussion. And so um, I think we will conclude uh, or adjourn directly after that. Thank you. Yes. Uh, there, you know what? I think our offices are back there. If anyone needs assistance uh, leaving, we do have, uh, I believe, uh, some staff, chaperone, uh, safety officers in the back. Please feel free to ask for assistance if you need that. That's what they're there for. Thank you. And thanks for coming.